good morning and welcome to our online service at St Bartholomew's Church in Edgbaston. Whether this is your first time joining us uh, or whether you've been with us through the pandemic, I'm so glad that you're here and able to uh, join with us. During our service, we'll have opportunity to sing praises to God. Uh, the hymns, of course, are, are pre-recorded, uh, but you can join in at home. Please do uh, lift your voices. The, the words will all appear on the screen. Uh, we'll also have uh, a chance to bring our needs to God in prayer. Uh, Reverend Dr Saskia Barnum will be leading our prayers of intercession uh, and uh, our curate Charlie Butler will be uh, preaching for us uh, from Mark's Gospel later on. But just at the uh, start of our service, um, there's a, a verse from the book of Genesis that really caught my eye as I was reading it uh, this week, looking out of the window at uh, the signs of uh, spring, at uh, the days getting longer, uh, the crocuses beginning to appear uh, around uh, Edgbaston. Uh, and uh, I was reminded again uh, of this verse from uh, Genesis chapter 8. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. These changings of the seasons speak to us of God's faithfulness uh, and of his preservation of the human race that he loves uh, and of his special care uh, for his people. So we're going to begin our service by singing praise to this God uh, on whom we can completely depend, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, work for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen the collect for today, the second Sunday of Lent. Almighty God, you show to those who are in error the light of your truth, that they may return to the way of righteousness. 
Grant to all those who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion that they may reject those things that are contrary to their profession and follow all such things as are agreeable to the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Together we say, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is read for us by Nick Hollinshead. A reading from Psalm 22, verses 23 to 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All the descendants of Jacob, honour him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfil my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live for ever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. This is the word of the Lord. Before Charlie comes to read to us from Mark's Gospel, we're going to sing again. Alleluia, sing to Jesus.
Our second reading this morning is from Mark chapter 8. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous gener and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In a moment, Charlie will preach to us from that passage in Mark 8. But first, as the church together, we declare our faith using the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you very much, Nick. A very good morning to you all. Our gospel reading for this morning, on the face of it, might seem very austere, even harsh. And actually, when you um, look at what's just happened before this moment in Mark's gospel, it seems, well, frankly, bizarre or would have done, particularly to Peter and those first disciples and probably the first, the earliest Christians. Because just before our reading, Peter has declared that Jesus is the Christ. It's an enormous moment in the gospel for one of the characters within the story, one of the followers of Jesus himself, to say this about him. The Christ or the Messiah is this figure in Jewish thought, ancient Jewish thought, who's going to come and make the whole world right again. It's the sort of almost a Superman sort of person who was going to deal with all that was wrong with the world, all that turned things, good things, bad in the world turn them all on their head and bring glory and perfection and beauty and holiness and joy lasting forever and ever. So Peter's just realized that that's who Jesus is. And yet, did you hear the first thing that Jesus says about himself as the Christ, giving his job description? He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. The one who's going to come and make the whole world right, the one who's going to deal with all the wrong, is going to be rejected by the very people who should have accepted him. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. <clears throat> and not only that, if you want to follow him, if you want to belong to his people and be, be one of his, his team, your life is going to involve suffering and, and death. That's the imagery, isn't it? Taking up their cross in verse 34 denying yourself, losing yourself. That's what it will take to belong to him and be one of his followers. Perhaps we know this passage already. If we've been around church, we probably have heard it um, a number of times. But it would have been really shocking for Peter, for the earliest Christians, to hear this about Jesus once they've kind of clocked that he's the Messiah. I was trying to think, what would it be like today? I, 
the closest I can get to is if you imagine Boris Johnson coming on the television and saying, we have found the cure for COVID. Remember when the first vaccines were announced? Imagine if he comes and said, we've found the vaccine, the thing that we were longing for to make everything right again. We've got it. Going to involve, once you take it, you will die. So, excuse me. The cure for the world's ills involves death. We're all going to die. That's, that's what it's going to take to have this cure. It makes absolutely no sense. It makes absolutely no sense for the thing that makes the whole world right again to revolve around brutal and bloody death. But that's what Jesus says here. Now, some people through history, as they've heard Jesus make this kind of claim and articulate this this way of life for his followers, have said, well, it can't actually mean dying. That, that, that's, that's crazy. So it must mean something like an extreme form of asceticism, some kind of extreme, extreme form of self-renunciation, of losing your life so completely in terms of your sort of practices of, of, of going without. Is that what Jesus is calling us to do here? We can become monks when we consider all that's good in the world, just to reject it and so completely lose all trappings of who we are as human beings and, and life in the world that we can more fully follow him. I don't think that's quite sort of capturing what Jesus is about, what he's saying in these verses. And the way I think to, to begin to sort of get into them and to make sense of them is to see how in verse 33, Jesus gets really, really angry. It's a, it's a moment of, 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 again, shock and surprise that Jesus would say to Peter, the guy who's just clocked his identity, get behind me, Satan. It sort of comes out of the blue. You might think, Gee, are you kind of unhinged here, Jesus? Just because Peter didn't quite understand your mission. Why does he get so angry at him? Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Well, do you notice, did you hear that Jesus comes out with this, this outburst at the very moment that having been taken aside by Peter and clearly sort of off to one side, he turns back round and he looks at his disciples. It looks like he's still talking one-on-one -on -one to Peter, but he's talking to Peter with the disciples in his vision, in his view. And that is the, the moment where this extraordinary rebuke of P Peter comes, comes from him. Get behind me, Satan. I think what's going on here <clears throat> is that this is a moment of Jesus being tempted. Do you remember, we, we've seen one moment of temptation of Jesus back at the start of Mark's gospel, straight after his baptism, where Satan comes and as he's led into the wilderness for this kind of encounter, well, the other gospels, Matthew and Luke in particular, say that the temptation that, that, that Satan brings to Jesus in, in, in that first temptation is basically a temptation to shortcut his way to glory. Satan says to him, you don't need to go through all that you're about to go through to get the sort of prestige of being the Messiah. I can give it to you without having to go through all the pain. You've got the power. You've got the authority. You have to make a deal with me, but it's worth it where it's going to get you to. It seems to me that that sort of offer is what Jesus detects in Peter's rebuke of him. Peter, when, when he, he hears Jesus say to, to the disciples, to the crowd, look, I'm going to suffer and die. Peter thinks that can't possibly be the case. You're, the, the Messiah can't do that. But through Peter, Peter is almost, I suppose, the vehicle for Satan to come to Jesus again and say, look, you don't need to be that sort of Messiah. You don't need to be a suffering Christ. 
you can get the glory and a slightly easier way, a shortcut. But when Jesus turns from having that sort of spoken in his ear and he looks at his disciples, <clears throat> that, if you like, underlines for him. I have to go through with this mission. He says, doesn't he? The son of man must suffer many things. There's a sense of imp I'm impelled. I'm compelled to do this. There's something that means I have to go and suffer and die. And it's like that comes to a head, comes to a sharp focus as he looks at his disciples. Really, it's like what he's saying is as tempting as it might be to take the shortcut to glory. The only way that I can save these people before me is by suffering and dying. So get behind me, Satan. I'm not going to take the shortcut. I'm going the long way round, although it leads through my suffering, my rejection and my death, because that is the way that I will save these people I see standing right before me. So what the radical nature of this mission of Jesus points us to? Well, it's the radical nature of the problem that every human being has. <clears throat> what Jesus is saying here is not just that a, a, a sort of change of circumstance is the thing that will save us. Likely Peter and other first century Jews thought if we just could get this Messiah, to deal with the things that are obviously wrong about our existence at the moment. We could get the Romans out, the occupying force. We could make Israel the kind of great nation that we once were. Then all will be well. That's what we want the Messiah to do. Change our circumstances or lead us to victory and life and joy. But Jesus says that's not what it's going to take. <clears throat> He says the problem, in other words, goes deeper than just changing your external circumstances. He has to suffer for you. Because if you peel away the layers of, you know, we have all kinds of problems in our lives, all kinds of things that aren't the way they should be. But if you peel back the layers of those, then underneath it all, there's a root, there's a base, there's a foundational problem which is that we are alienated from the God who made us. We were made for a relationship with him. We were made for a sort of relationship with him that will sustain us, that will nourish us, that will make us the people we were meant to be. But we're, ex we're estranged from him. Our existence in the world is one of feeling distant from him. In the end, that's because we have taken the route of, of turning our backs on him of listening to him, following him, going his way. And all that leads us to is, well, being starved of the nourishment that relating to him rightly would lead to. And that's why a simple change of circumstance isn't going to be enough for us to be saved, for Peter and the first disciples of Jesus to be saved. We need Jesus to do something mu much more radical than that. We need him to give his life, to pay the price of cosmic justice and open the way for us back to this God who we are estranged, we are alienated from. That's the radical nature of the problem that Jesus points to. He's effectively saying to, to Peter, you don't understand the depth of it. To Satan, you don't know what I have to do to save these people. The short circuit, the shortcut, isn't the way it's going to happen. It also, I think, when you start to see that that's what Jesus' mission is about, makes sense of the radical response that he calls for. Let me read those verses again in verse 34 onwards. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, 
But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Jesus isn't saying here, I don't think, that what he's after in our lives is a sort of grand gesture of self-renunciation. I'm going to refuse myself. If you've seen um, Monty Python, The Life of Brian, you might remember towards the end, the suicide squad come from the Palestinian Judean People's Fund, or whatever exactly they're called. And it looks like they're going to come and save the day, but they all pull out daggers and commit suicide. And I, I think the point is that, you know, in, in a sort of mockery of the way religions sometimes talk about themselves, the idea of losing your life is a sort of, you know, a noble sounding in certain, in certain circumstances, but a noble sounding sort of waste of time. That's not what Jesus is calling his followers to. He's not calling them to a sort of asceticism, a self-renunciation, complete and without any real purpose. What Jesus is saying here might lead you to consider sort of practices of self-renunciation, but we have to get there in a second. First of all, what Jesus is calling his followers, the crowd, anyone who's interested in him, to do here is basically to stop trying to save yourself. To receive what Jesus has done for you, what he's going to do in, in the rest of Mark's gospel, to go and give his life to suffer and die. Rather than trying to save yourself, to, rather than saying, I don't, I don't want you to do that for me, Jesus, I've got it within me. Now, this invitation. <clears throat> I think is particularly relevant, particularly important for for you if you are if you like looking in on Christianity. It's striking that in verse thirty four, Jesus calls the crowd along with his disciples. He wants this to be heard by people, whoever they are, wherever they're coming from. If they're just sort of on the edge of Christian community, if they're not convinced about all these things themselves, he wants them to hear this as well as his his followers. So it's just worth pausing i think to consider what exactly he means and how it, how does it work out in our lives that we could sort of be trying to save ourselves particularly if we, we wouldn't use that language ourselves I, i'm not i'm not out to save myself i'm just out to you know make my way in the world from the perspective of christianity from from the perspective of of the bible God, as the creator of the world, has made a world that is full of meaning, full of goodness and life. It's no surprise, I think, that one of the pictures that the Bible uses from the very beginning is the world as, well, having the potential to be transformed into a beautiful garden. In the book of Genesis, um, the world is almost described as a kind of a wilderness that God gives to humanity to transform into a beautiful garden. And Adam and Eve, the first human beings, are like, are like have the vocation, if you like, of gardeners. What's going on with that image, I think, is something like, well, if you've ever seen a good gardener at work, I am not a good gardener. I spend my life pulling up things I shouldn't pull up and leaving in things I should be pulling up. But if you've seen a good gardener at work, you'll see the way that they can take what looks like a slightly unpromising patch of land and with careful cur curating, tendering, tending and, and looking after, drawing out all the potential that is in that patch of ground. That is the sort of vocation given to humanity with all of creation that God gives to us. Both the sort of the, the physical, the the earth, literally, but also the relational, all the potential that there is in our relationships with each other, all the potential there is in, in, our, in our abilities, our power to do things in the world. God has given this good world to us for that purpose, that we can curate it, that we can tend it, that we can draw out its goodness and take what might be a, a, a slightly overgrown wilderness and turn it into a beautiful garden. 
to enjoy, to celebrate, to spend time in, to give back to him in worship and thanks. The problem is that it's very easy to start thinking that the meaning of life that the whole point of it is found simply in the garden itself. And we can, we can sort of draw out so much joy from the garden, from enjoying the world we have before us, that we sort of forget that there is a God who gave this world to us in the first place. There's a God who we can know through enjoying all that he gives us. A God who is the very one who gives this world its meaning, its joy, its beauty, its purpose. And a God who, whose existence goes far beyond this world. And who, as, as if we know him, our lives, our existence, all that joy and purpose and beauty will last beyond the end of our physical lives too. But the, if you like, the problem we have as human beings is that we place all the weight on the, on the, on the momentary, on the good, but the temporary of the current garden that we're enjoying. We start to think that's where ultimate meaning is found. That's where purpose, that's where, where your, your life's investment ought to be. And the sort of consistent testimony is that if you do that, and if you consistently do that, if you pour your life into that, well, you will start to find that actually it will never deliver, never ultimately give you the satisfaction that you thought it would. In some ways, quite scarily, the religious life has just the same danger built into it. And perhaps it's even worse because you think that your life of serving God and the religious duties you do is somehow purer, somehow more honoring. But when you do those things, forgetting the God who gave those your abilities to you in the first place, well, then you'll be find yourself more alienated, more f further away from God. Because you'll be blind to your true condition. So you see what Jesus is calling us to in these verses here is not that grand gesture of self-renunciation or that that foolish idea of, I don't know, somehow losing your life altogether. It's rather turning, if you like, to to look inside you and to think, what is it in the end that I am resting on, that I'm leaning on for that sense that I'm somebody in the world? For the sense that I have you know, justified, we might say, that I my existence is validated. Whatever that thing is. In the end, if it is not God, not Jesus Christ and what he thinks of you, then in the long run, you will find that that thing will let you down. That it will not be able to bear the weight of your expectations, of your desires, of, of that longing for validation, for who I am, for purpose, for identity. That we all have and that we're all tempted to to. to to place the weight of on thing in things in this world. But at the same time as recognizing that about ourselves, looking within and saying, okay, that's that's what I'm doing right now. That's where I'm tempted, what I'm tempted to do. These words of Jesus point to how he is the answer. How when we come to him, when we accept and, and receive from him what he has done for us. Then we don't just find that, you know, we have some kind of forgiveness certificate passed down to us. Well, now you're OK. Rather, we find <clears throat> that Jesus gives us our very lives back again. Whoever wants to save their life, if if what you're about now is just building for the here and now. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. When we come to Jesus Christ, 
when we acknowledge the way that we are alienated, estranged from God, the way that we are looking to build our identity on things in this world only, we find forgiveness. We find reconciliation, belonging to God again. And we find that he gives us who we truly are. He gives that back to us. We become who we were made to be. One of the most um, striking examples of that sort of alternative life that I've come across recently is from um, this book by, well, it's, it's from Eugene Peterson, who writes about discovering in the, the sto a story by Dostoevsky called The Idiot, that this, this new life in Jesus Christ really is an attractive and beautiful one. The, the, the book by Dostoevsky is called The Idiot because it tells the story of, a, of, a, of a, a man who people think is a prince, Prince Mishkin. Let me read how Peterson describes him. It's a good summary because Dostoevsky is quite heavy. So here's the summary from Eugene Peterson. Prince Mishkin strikes everyone who meets him as simple and naive. He gives the impression that he doesn't know how the world works. People assume that he has no experience in the complexities of society. He is innocent of the real world. He's an idiot. The St. Petersburg society he enters is portrayed by Dostoevsky as trivial and superficial. Pretense and pose are epidemic among these people. All of them are judged by how much money they have, what kind of family they come from, who they know. Quote, empty headed people who in their smugness did not realize themselves that much of their, ex that much of their excellence was just a veneer. The prince is cautiously admitted into their drawing rooms only because of the possibility that he might be connected with nobility. But he is suspect from the start because he so obviously doesn't know the ropes, has no conception of the importance of names and station. He definitely doesn't fit. So that's the situation when Prince Mishkin begins to enter this society, which Dostoevsky describes as trivial and superficial. And then gradually, Without anyone knowing quite how it happens, he becomes the central person for these trivialized and obsessive lives. They are mad for recognition or sex or money. But though he associates easily with them, he is curiously exempt from their obsessions. Various characters in the story latch onto him in order to use him, but he is not usable. He simply is. He is not good for anything, he is simply good. Gradually, in the midst of the furious machinations by which men and women are trying to get their own way, he emerges as one who is significant simply in his humanity. People find themselves approaching him for counsel, attracted to this strange man, hardly knowing why they are pulled to him like filings to a magnet. They have no vocabulary for this phenomenon. But even as he becomes influential, he doesn't exercise his influence, doesn't make anything happen doesn't relish power, doesn't tamper with these souls. The silent source of his detachment is that he has no personal agenda. It strikes me that that is the difference that Jesus Christ makes, can make in your life. When he gives you yourself back, you stop needing to look around creation, if you like, the garden, for that sense of meaning and purpose, that sense of identity, who you are, that sense of validation. You get that from God, and you can go out into the world with no agenda, no need to use people to get your own way, no need to buy into the things that the rest of the world buys into for finding itself or validating its existence. Dostoevsky says that those things in St. Petersburg society, sex and money and power and whatever it is, you can just go in there as a new person. But in that sense, as just your new person, your true self. And you're able to serve, to love, to care, to listen, to bless, to speak truth, not to be afraid. That, it seems to me, is life, the way of Jesus, finding your true self in him. You find that he is like a well of life and love inside of you. 
making someone who can bubble over with that sort of deeply attractive life to the world around you. But it comes as you lose your life in Jesus, as you you give up that chasing for yourself and your identity in the world around you and you get it from Jesus who gives his life for you. Now, that is a radical claim. So it's, I think, a paradoxical one. It's not something that comes easily to us. I take it that's why God has given us these sort of rhythms of week by week, Sunday by Sunday, day by day, the opportunity to come back to him, to acknowledge that, wow, again, I have, I have failed to live the way that you've called me to, the, the way that is best for me. I need to remember who I am in Jesus Christ day by day if I belong to him so that I won't simply be drawn back to trying to save my life and in the end losing it. And if we, you're not yet convinced about Christianity, I wonder if you can see here, Christianity is not just a sort of lifestyle option to add on. It is something which touches the very most fundamental part of who you are. It really does call you to a radical change of perspective, change of focus. As you say, I'm prepared to give up my life. But by doing that, I'll get my life back again. Well, let's take a few moments just to ponder what that might look like for ourselves. Consider where the Lord is particularly sort of teaching us this morning. And then we're going to respond in the words of our next song, All for Jesus. Let's be quiet for a few moments and then we'll sing together. As we continue to respond to the Lord Jesus, we will pray and Saskia is going to lead us as we do so. Lord Jesus, 
you once rebuked Peter for having merely human concerns. Help us, your children, to understand the ways of God. We see only with our mortal vision. We do not always understand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we sometimes lack the courage to face hard truths and hard tasks. We long for the familiar comforts. We shrink from being tested. Strengthen us, Lord. Give us the resolution always to seek to do your will, to know that you are with us in every trial. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up to you those who suffer in body, in mind and in spirit. We ask that you give them assurance of your loving presence. Comfort and heal them, gracious Lord. Be with those who minister to them. Be with healers, carers, anxious families and with those who are lonely and afraid. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your church here and throughout the world. May your followers have the courage to give of themselves for your sake to lead your people boldly, knowing that you walk beside them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, may this season of Lent teach us to examine our own lives, to reject the easy options, and putting our faith entirely in you, to walk with you now and always. Make us aware of others' needs. Give us the means to meet those needs with resolute courage, with trust and love, knowing that for our sakes you conquered even death. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. In gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is To God Be the Glory.
too. Well, uh, we've come very much to the end of the uh, part, part of our service this morning. Uh, just a, a couple of items of, of church family business to, uh, to bring to your attention. The first is that now that the Prime Minister has announced uh, plans to ease and eventually end lockdown, we're actively uh, thinking about how we can return to meeting in person in church. And um, the PCC will be reviewing a, uh, a plan in two weeks time uh, to look at uh, getting back into the church building uh, and beginning to uh, look at what life after lockdown uh, will mean for us. Um, we are very hopeful of being back in church before Easter. So uh, obviously we will have to follow uh, the data as the government's advised, but um, the signs are very hopeful and we look forward to being able to be together. Uh, if you want to receive information as it uh, as it comes out on, on these sorts of things, then uh, the best thing I can suggest is that you sign up for our weekly church emails. If you don't uh, receive those already, you can uh, click on a link in the description uh, and sign up, uh, and then uh, you'll be kept informed uh, as and when decisions are made about what's happening next uh, and uh, about events that are happening in uh, church life. Uh, this week we have prayer meetings on uh, Tuesday and Thursday lunchtimes at 12.30. We gather on Zoom. Uh, details of that are available if you sign up uh, to receive uh, the relevant emails for that. Um, and on Wednesday at 10.30 we have a, a service of morning prayer via Zoom as well. So do join that uh, if you can. Again, um, the details of that Zoom call come out via email. Uh, and. Um, in, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to begin our new Alpha course uh, online. I'm very pleased that uh, a number of you have already signed up to become uh, part of that group. Uh, but uh, if you would like to find out more about uh, the Christian faith or just uh, get yourself a refresher, uh, then um, please do send an email to alpha at edgebustonoldchurch.org.uk. Uh, and again, uh, that email address is in the description of this video. Uh, and you will be able to uh, get in touch and, and let us know that you're interested. And um, particularly helpful if you could let us know of a particular day or uh, evening that, that would work for you as we're trying to uh, make it as convenient for everyone as we can. Well, uh, we're so glad that you've joined us and um, look forward to uh, perhaps seeing you in the flesh before uh, too long. But now as we close our service, uh, we are going to say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. My Lord and God